Welcome to the Consummate Athlete Podcast, where our goal is to help you find health and community through movement. I'm Molly Herford, a writer, coach, and yoga teacher. And I'm Peter Glassford, an endurance coach and kinesiologist. Every week, we're talking to athletes and experts who can help you lead your best active, adventurous life. Whether you're a gravel racer, a marathon runner, or you just got out on your first bike ride yesterday, we're here cheering you on. You can also visit us online at consummateathlete.com for coaching information and training tips, nutrition advice, yoga flows, bike skills, and more. And now, let's get into this week's episode. Hello, hello. Welcome back to the Consummate Athlete Podcast. Peter, how's it going? It's going well. Excited to be here. Yeah, how about yourself? Going really well. My uh, my traps are finally feeling uh, a little better. That's right. You were doing new things. You tried at a, a boxing class. Yes, I feel very consummate athlete this week. I, uh, I got my sister and I a private uh, session with a boxing coach. Uh, for for Christmas and we did that this past week and it was super fun um I mean not to say that I'm planning on like participating in uh in boxing or anything but I I definitely would go back and keep doing the classes it was really a cool experience and felt very very badass afterwards I'm not gonna lie okay then you were probably a little nervous going into it you know trying something new tell you what it is terrifying like for some trying reason, something new or trying boxing? something new and just under the going in trying to actually be a beginner um and i think a lot of people who listen to this podcast would probably understand this feeling especially when you have a sport that you're already like, pretty decent at uh the idea of going in and, and sort of starting from square one and trying to go in with zero ego attached um and just like be that beginner and get into that mindset and i'd say especially for me in this one because i'm trying really hard to not uh, not hurt myself, but also not overextend myself, um, as I have the tendency to do in most things. Right. So I had to go in and be like, okay, we're just going to sag this. We're going to like sandbag this boxing lesson. It's going to be great. Um, mm-hmm. well, it's good. Go- yeah. We, uh, it's something, you know, obviously that's, that was part of the reason we started this podcast, right? Was to try and do stuff like that. And if you go back to some of our real early episodes you know that was you know we were trying to explore some of these different sports we were you know there was nascar there was football there was all sorts of things and i still think there's you know something to that for sure and i think if nothing else it's you know exploring this beginner mindset and something so out of your normal uh you know with the hopes that maybe when we come back to you know running or cycling or whatever your thing is that maybe you're more likely to you know engage in that deliberate practice where you're actually like pushing your limits Mm -hmm. uh, which you know is probably the key to you know both enjoyment and uh uh, you know proficiency i guess right further proficiency yeah and i would say trying a new sport even if it's not something you're particularly interested in or have any interest in continuing with i think it's really good because it makes you think really hard about how your body is moving and reacting to stuff uh in a way that for example, bike skills, because I've ridden a bike for so long, because I've ridden a mountain bike for so long, uh, learning bike skills at a clinic isn't always super, weirdly enough, it's not super intuitive for me because I kind of already know how to ride a bike. Uh, so taking this class made me just very, very body aware, I would say. Right. And I think that's that's something we, we all kind of need every once in a while. It's just this reminder of different ways that our, our body moves and mm-hmm. Yeah, it was very, very cool. And things like boxing are very good for developing force and, you know, learning, you know, the, the footwork is always tricky, but, you know, how trying to sort of like rotate and, and put some power into a punch, right? Which is, mm-hmm. you know, I think in cycling, you know, a lot of people, we, we might call it aggression or power or speed, but a lot of people are not able to, you know, if we think about a bunny hop or jumping or really aggressive cornering, right? Most people just don't move that way, right? They can't transmit force. So, I, you know, boxing might be a way, something like that, where you're edging into it, where we take the bike out of it because that's a whole other, you're strapped to this thing moving across the ground, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's actually interesting. That sort of reminds me of a conversation I was having during the jukebox cycling gravel chat that I, I led on Thursday night. And you can find that over facebook.com backslash jukebox cycling, uh, the whole hour long chat with Alexi Vermeule and Dylan Johnson and Adam Roberge is up there. Uh, and we got to talking about weight training and strength training at the very end. Uh, and I was talking about how I'd been talking to their uh, teammate Ruby West about how she does some upper body and there is some some dissension in the ranks about any upper body work as a cyclist 
And I, I actually stand by Ruby that it is super important, especially in, I mean, she's track and cyclocross, so it makes a lot of sense. In one, you're picking your bike up, and the other, the track starts are so muscularly demanding of your upper body as well. If you don't have a strong upper body, you could lose that whole front wheel uh, just with how you have to crank the pedals. Right. Uh, so, you know, for her, it obviously makes sense. But I think for, for any cyclist, having that upper body power is just so, so important. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think the research is pretty clear. You know, a lot of our listeners and my clients are, are, you know, adults, normal people, you know, so I think it's full body strength, right? I've never really thought about strength as a upper and lower body. So when I have clients, and it's odd, so many of these issues where people, you'll get a question like that, where it's like, should I do upper body strength as if they're not going to do lower body strength? Because there's like, that's what I heard in what you said there, that they were like, not going to do lower body strength, because I don't know if their legs are tired or something. But then you get another person who you know, only do lower body because their arms, they don't need them because they ride a bicycle. But that's most cyclists. And it's such a perplexing thing. To me. <laughs> but it's like two opposite approaches. And I, I just I'm like, you know, we just know you like squat and you do push ups. And, you know, it, it involves the whole the, the body is one piece. Right. And it's mm-hmm. I've just never thought about strength in that split way. And you get people who have come from like a bodybuilding thing where it's like back and chest days or something like that right push and pull days or something yeah and i would also say uh in this conversation that we had it was really hard for me to to kind of bite my tongue a little bit because the conversation definitely tended more towards thinking in terms of professional cyclists who are focused on their cycling career and race results right Uh, so one of them actually said i never think about strength in terms of like whole body health and he said it very sarcastically which actually like i almost just like muted him after that right no but that's Uh, probably fair why would he well exactly but the for the average person and i include myself and most most upper level athletes unless you're in that very pointy end of the stick i actually do think it's so important like whole body health is is the thing (laughs) that Mm -hmm. that's it that's yeah, I mean, once you've moved past the point where you think you're going to make NFL money, which I don't know which cyclist thinks they're making NFL money, but, you know, that's, uh, again, I steal lots of Dan John things, but he has a quadrant system of what type of athlete you are, and there's a collision sports uh, quadrant, right? And that's like when you're going to make enough money, basically, that like your family and their family are going to be well off because of you, like, sacrificing your body and, you know, being very elite. And then there's sort of this other quadrant, which is the rest of us, where we're sort of fighting this this fight against gravity is the way he describes it, right? Sagging body, you know, trying to get up off the floor. And, and that's the rest of us, right? Ultimately, that's what we're trying to do. You know, great if we can ride a bike, you know, with some athleticism here and there, but that's ultimately the fight, right? And strength training is a big part of that. Walking is part of that, um, you know, that fight against gravity, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in also in other things that we've been writing and working on lately, we have a post over at consummateathlete.com that has Peter's favorite winter cycling gear. And I didn't of- realize it was only my own. Yeah, because oh, I did. Okay, winter- I have to stand behind this post. Yeah, okay. I did winter running gear <laughs> oh, okay. a few weeks ago, so people can also grab that in that same. Now, article. did my bag accessory make it in? It did. Okay, there you go. The most expensive of my accessories. If you want the best, <laughs> the best free hack, head over to consummateathlete.com. I want to get you. I guess that's your out of the. Is it a three hours or four hours? I think it's four hours now, but it's the reuse part of the. Yeah, there you go. The cycle of recycling. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the other article that we have uh, is actually a link over to Ontario Cycling, where I write for their blog. And I have one that's uh, five signs that you should maybe step away from the trainer temporarily. Can you give us a preview? What would be a sign that I should step away from? The, so take a break. Uh, my personal favorite that I wrote was that your family misses you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's good. Uh, and we laugh, but... You know, I know a lot of people are trying to get in their mileage, get in their training, and that means they head down to the basement and they might miss out on those snowball fights and the sled rides and the ski days with the family sure. yeah, the, the snowshoes. The, embracing the context, right? Again, we're, you know, the consummate athlete idea is that we're, we're using the environment, the context where we are, right? So it's always, it is tough when it's like we get so focused on some of these, you know, we're going to talk a bit about metrics today maybe, but... Um, you know, distance. And so I only ride on flat roads or like on my rollers because the wheels move at 40 kilometers an hour and I'm just accumulating this fake distance, but skipping out on the best fat biking or skiing or hiking or snowshoeing, or as you say, spending time with family, going to a boxing class. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know. We got to be careful. I think you got to be careful. So that's what about, did you have something about, you know, if there was illness, is that a, a time to step away from the trainer? Was that in there? 
Uh, not as such. I do have a thing about uh, anytime you have skin stuff going on. Okay. It's definitely one. Obviously illness, um, but that would be stepping away from the trainer and training mm, okay. uh, versus like well, a trainer specific. So this break. is, you know, COVID's a little more common now, but we'll just call it respiratory. You know, you have a cold, the flu, whatever. And, and so there's always this tendency that we, we need to get back on the trainer and do an, a spin, which probably, you know, sometimes that's good. Sometimes the weather's, you know, not great. It's easier to get on the trainer than go outside. But I don't know. I think sometimes it's better to fresh air, maybe get some sun on the face, if not more of your body. Uh, so that's a lot of times too. I just, you know, someone today I was talking to and I was just like, just why would you burn that train? I think about trainer energy is there's like, you only get so much, right? And some people just light it up. You know, I'm Everesting. I just think about that as like, that's like two years of trainer energy to Everest or something. right? <laughs> and I'd rather just burn that in like hour or 90 minutes. A lot of my clients know, you know, we, we, limited a lot of times to 90 minutes you can go outside and run afterwards or you can go outside and ride for a bit and then come in and do your 90 minutes on the trainer like it's not that you shouldn't train longer i'm just very hesitant to say you know you got to be careful going over i think right and it's just it's that quality that risk reward i don't know you're in your basement <laughs> just breathing away i don't know so i think with the respiratory stuff it's like if you're sick just save the trainer energy up and go for a walk right it's probably going to be as rejuvenating if not more so yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, we'll check. We'll link to, so we got a link to that. I got to write this down here. We're going to link to this OCA. This is Ontario Cycling post on taking a break from the trainer. Yep, and Peter's favorite winter cycling kit. Over at consummateathlete.com. Yep, yep. Okay. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, that actually feeds very nicely into one of our questions we got today, uh, which is how high my CTL or fitness score should be. So CTL is chronic training load. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And this is like your TSS per day over the last sort of month and a half or so. TSS is... That's uh, training stress score. Yeah. So the... the uh, no, hang on. Let's let's back up. TSS. Is that specific to training peaks? Like that's a training peaks metric? Yeah, or? probably. I mean, I think this is all coming from like a, you know, uh, what is that called? Impulse. Th uh, so there's banisters. Like basically it's like there's a, a stress, a training stress. You know, this is like an impulse. So this is like your ride was three hours. It gave you... a however many impulse points or load points. Uh, and then so there's like a mathematical, it's all math, right? It's trying to take this physiology and put a math model behind it. And so the idea is that over time you have this chronic load. Uh, this is like acute chronic ratio. So you've trained this many. I like to describe it as hours, uh, but TSS is a, the, the sort of combination of the intensity and the volume, right? So your TSS for today, your training stress score for today is the combination of how long did you ride and how hard did you ride relative, this is the key part, to your current threshold in the case of TSS and training peaks. Um, so it's relative to you. So someone, you know, your pro tour rider could go out and do 100 TSS points. Uh, and then this beginner could do 100 TSS points. And, it, and, it, and it'd be similar times, but they would look very different, right? Like that, that Tour de France rider could be riding for, you know, three hours at almost 300 watts maybe. Uh, whereas, you know, that would be, you know, the beginner might ride for three hours at 80 watts or something, uh, right? But they'd get the same points relative to them. So that's sometimes the trick with people that they don't, that it gets like confusing is that, you know, that beginner or intermediate might have a relatively high CTL. So this is the average of all those days over the last month and a half. Who are you on average on the long term? as you know an elite cycles generally elites train more so their their ctl will be higher but that's the idea now it strikes me that so much of this needs the caveat of just this math is so wildly imperfect mm -hmm. and just absolutely doesn't take into account i mean any other stress in your life to for the obvious but it also just doesn't take into account you and your genetics and your feelings and right. just everything else well and and so there's a few things with that it's yeah I, I think about it like weight right like it's a result this is where on average that's where you end up for better or worse you're happy with it you're not no one's happy with it and i think that's probably true of of ctl everyone wants it to be higher uh so, you know or lower or different um but they want ctl to be higher generally um, but we don't really think about like, it's reflecting like what we're getting now and, and it, it going higher may be better, but we don't know. Right. So it's sort of like weight, whereas it going lower may not actually be better depending on what you're trying to accomplish. And, and at some point too much is too much. Right. 
too little is too little with weight, right? So we got to be careful, but it, it is the result. So then what it is, is the result of our actions over time, right? Your weight is your res- actions. over time. There's obviously a lot of factors that go into that, but what, the way I think about CTL is that that's just what this person's life. And, and again, we don't work with elites that much. These are normal people. So given the time you have and the stress you have from work and family and, you know, everything else that's wrapped up in that, this is just a rough measure of your intensity and dur- duration, you know, on your average day. And yours just has nothing to do with someone else's. So there's really no kind of comparison between yours. I think and- you couldn't bucket people. Uh, assuming, again, this is all, because it's mathematical, like your, your math has to be good. Your data has to be good. So if it's junky data, like you've had errors or your power meter's off or your heart rate monitor, you never wear it. Oh, I guess actually maybe I'm going to pause you and say as a cyclist, like what do you need as inputs for a CTL to be re- like right. mathematically so, good? So purists, and, and I mean, I think they're right. The math's better if you had a power meter all the time and probably you trained on the road or a trainer all the time because uh, then the data is good. Like in mountain biking, you miss a ton of the stress because it's upper body, you're coasting, you're absorbing vibration, right? This is never captured in that, right? Heat is not captured. Environment's not captured. Even so, brain, right? Like mountain biking <laughs> versus just flat For sure. So, so that's like, we can get into that, but that's sort of separate. But ideally you would have power every single workout and, and you'd have a, your threshold would be well calibrated. Most people who come for plans and stuff, it's just like, the number just seems so off because their threshold, like they never adjusted or they think it's way higher or lower than it is. And it's like, you got to keep adjusting it because it keeps changing, right? Like as you get fitter or less fit, which people don't like that, but it ebbs and flows in the season, right? In July for nationals, I'm at my fittest. So, you know, that threshold has to go up, but that also means that like what that workout to get a hundred TSS is now a burlier workout, right? And it doesn't work linear. Like you don't get a higher threshold and then immediately you just can do all the same workouts. Like there's a, you know, it takes some time and that, that's hard for people. But then if you take two months off, you don't get to keep your threshold. It's not for life, right? Right. <laughs> right. It's sort of like your weight. You can diet really, really hard for a month of January. But then if you, if it slips, right, like it, you go back, right? Nothing's permanent like that. Mm-hmm. So coming kind of back to this question of how high your fitness score should be, uh, I guess my second sub question here is how long does one need to be collecting this good data mm. to have a CTL that actually share, like shows anything? Cause I know, for example, you know, we, we talked about TSS a lot when we were coaching some of these junior camps where the camps lasted three weeks, but a lot of the times that was the first time the kids were actively uploading every workout or you know properly tracking it so you had tss that went from like they'd done even though they'd been riding obviously the you know data is not getting recorded perfectly so there's just no it was all over the place it's all over the place yeah and so that would be like you'd look at this training camp and you'd compare that so that's the acute load versus the chronic load but can we even get a chronic load if we don't have No, it's like not really relevant, data. right? And so that's where you have to know the context of the data. So to your answer, like I'd rather have years. I always show clients, you know, I have back to I think 2008 and the earlier data is pretty spotty, but you know, say 2014 forward is like pretty good data pool. And you can see it. I call them little mountains, right? Like you can see around January, you know, it starts building. Usually we'd be, you know, away at training camps in California, so I build 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 and then Usually you start racing March, April, and then it sort of ebbs, you know, and even starts decreasing during race season. And then usually I lose interest after nationals a little bit and we do other stuff. We go hiking or whatever. So we're not necessarily collecting data for this, certainly not cycling as much. And, and then it sort of like tails off in the mountain, right? So if you're just picturing like, so for me, it would be, I said 2014 and now we're, you know, 21. So it's like seven or eight mountains. You know, if you just picture lines that make, you know, sort of humps, that's sort of the, the ebb and flow of your season, right? And you can make that again, hours sometimes make more sense, right? In January, you're not doing many hours. And then probably as it gets sunnier, you know, people are out in the spring and the summer doing bigger hours, right? And that's, I think makes a lot of sense, right? So what I'm hearing is if your CTL is just like a straight line, that's probably not actually a good thing. Yeah, I think that's the seasonality of life, right? I think your master's athletes probably are more consistently, you know, across the board. But again, we probably like to have some ebb and flow, right? If there's if there's like a big race, especially, right? If someone's doing like an unbound gravel, you would, you would expect to see a bit of a build up and then, you know, some 
recovery time after such a big challenge you know maybe sure. they're doing other sports uh, but I think probably you see like elite level people would have maybe a, a bigger ebb and flow. But again, they're going to be consistent just at a higher level. So right. I think you but you do want to have a seasonality. I think if you don't have a seasonality, that means, you know, that's like saying I train an hour every single day of every single week. Consistent. Yes. But, you know, is that I don't know if that's what we mean when we say consistency. Right. 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 OK. So in the question, how high should my CTL be? Now, I know you can't give. And like one number because obviously it's going to be different yeah, for everyone, yeah, as exactly. we said. but for say like your average masters rider that you have who trains give or take like 10 hours a week what would a, a sort of range of those numbers be just so people have some yeah, reference because yeah. i think it's one of those weird numbers where you have no i have no idea what 500 would mean or if, if numbers go that high <laughs> right right <laughs> right yeah so I always say, you know, there's probably three buckets that are common and this is with people I work in. So your Ironman triathletes, they'll be like 150, 140, you know, there's, you know, probably people who are higher and there's probably people who are, uh, I think I saw someone was doing Unbound. There's a good article. If you, I think it's Neil Shirley. If you Google Neil Shirley and Unbound, I, I can't recall who wrote the article. Uh, his coach anyhow wrote the article and talked a bit about his Unbound training for 2018. And he was writing in like the top 10. Now he, he was like, an elite mountain biker and has raced on the road like he's quite talented but you know as a normal adult now as i say he's you know now like the rest of us um and so he's a great i think he was like 90 if I, I i read the article but you know he can read it differently but so he was like a 90 right and he was riding in like the like up with jeff kabush and you know all these pro tour riders in unbound uh and i think he finished maybe 12th or 13th that year but he had a great ride Right. I think anyone would be pretty psyched with that. So I think it's a great example of, you know, a, he has this rich history and I see that with a lot of my clients. I have people who raced elite and now they're dads and moms and everything else. And you just, you can't take that away. Right. You probably know this person who's just got such a rich experience of mechanical, technical, tactical. They're just super smart racers, right? Like someone like Jeff Kabush is just always going to be up there. Right. Um, almost irregardless of fitness the fitness sort of gets them in the game but there's a point where you know they're there right and they might not last as long they might fade right towards the end or something so that's again 150 that's elite like all they're doing is riding and running right like you're elite iron man you're elite maybe gravel racers but i don't you know i i don't think you'd see that a ton but that's that's elite right so then i bucket people as they're sort of under say plus or minus 30 or 40 TSS per day. So this means you're riding, you could do 30, 40 TSS in, you know, a very easy hour, you know, would be that, right? So that'd be like your average, but you could probably get that done in a, you know, a high intensity 30 or 40 minute workout uh, on average again. So this is average. So on the weekend, you might do a longer ride. You might miss two or three days. I, I would say those people usually it's like, they're not riding. They're probably taking three and four days off. You know, they only get to ride or only choose to ride three or four days a week. So their frequency is more of the issue. Then you get into that 30 to say 70 or 80. This is more volume. And I talked a bit about this with Joe Friel when he was on, I think, right? This is a Joe Friel thing that I've sort of adapted and taken in my own direction a little bit. But that middle ground, you know, it's often that long ride during the week. These people are probably riding five and six and seven days a week. Uh, they're riding frequently enough, but then there's the volume and any volume we can add. I, I would probably group in some of that sweet spot tempo in this too. Uh, it's probably going to, it's going to make you faster, right? But then at some point you're doing enough volume, whatever that means, that you're getting into the seventies, the eighties, maybe even a hundreds. And that's when we get into the, in sorry, <clears throat> sorry, the intensity is important. And that's when we're a leader expert level, right? And you can move through these levels. Like if you take two or three months off, you're back to frequency and that that's going to work. You know, I had a client, really, really good rider. He's been off for a bit, then an injury, and he was like, oh, yeah, I should be doing these specific interviews. I'm like, dude, you just need to do something <laughs> most days of the week. Come back in a month or two. You know, just have fun. Don't burn, you know, the motivation doing like Everstein. Try and get outside. He really likes snowshoeing. So I was like, just be consistent. Right. So he's, you know, and then he'll get to the volume stage. We can start, you know, progressing sweet spot or whatever. Uh, so hopefully that helps. So I would say that's the bulk of my clients. Short answer is 30 to 75, 80. Uh, and that's all with the caveat of how you collect it and how you've set your thresholds and all this stuff. Now, I guess my last question on the note of CTL that's going to lead into our next question is, 
Should anyone really care about their CTL? No, I always like I don't look at mine that much. Like, I, again, I look at my humps and I know that, you know, around 100, a coach, Kevin Sims, a local. I remember him telling me one time, like, oh, around 100. That's like a good base. And I remember I think I've just internalized that as like, yeah, that's pretty good. I think if I was, you know, if we didn't have a little dog and, you know, business wasn't going really, really well and I was going to just really make a charge at it, I feel like and I was younger but somewhere in that 120, 130, I think now that I'm, you know, generally healthier, I think I understand things better than when I was a younger, you know, younger person, you know, the nutrition piece, the fueling, the work required, I think I could push, you know, 130, 140 would probably for me, again, age is the unknown there. Um, and again, if my marriage stayed together doing this 130, 140, it would not just, I just suspect. The, and I think that's the <laughs> thing. That's the, the heart of your question is how much should we do is really dependent on like, where's the optimal for your life and your body, you know, to, to get the, the fitness you need. Right. And I've had great years, you know, again, I touch hundred most years, uh, but that's, you know, hundred was all I could do over the last bunch of years, just with everything we have going on right again we got married there's all this stuff you know there's only so much time we weren't going away as much to these long training camps and that just it worked really i would say i've been racing better in some ways <laughs> over the last bunch of years despite not having higher ctl right which is the heart of your question you got to find where you're racing and feeling really good and it's not related to anyone else and it's not related to higher or lower it's just this is what i do normally this is my body weight normally I suspect I would be better a little lower. So I'm going to change. What are you going to change? So I'm going to ride longer on Sundays. I'm going to go from Peter who loves 90 minute workouts. I'm going to start doing hundred minute workouts. Um, you know, I'm going to eat vegetables with my breakfast. I'm going to eat whatever, right? What is the change? And I think that's the focus that as athletes, as people we want to, and then come back and check. What did that CTL? What did that look like? Right. Right. And that's, so that leads to the, the next question. Um, which is, well, it's less of a question and more of this concept that we've been pondering as we've been talking to a lot of different people heading into the new year, uh, whether you like it or not, a lot of people have new year's resolutions around whether it's weight or FTP or CTL or any of these acronyms around training, uh, just metrics when it comes to endurance training, what matters and what doesn't. And I think what you just said about CTL, um, what CTL is going to always miss and what FTP is going to miss or what mileage is always going to miss is the intangibles that can't be recorded. So that your technical trails on your mountain bike. Sure. Um, it's your, you know, if you're training in the heat, if you're training in altitude, it's strength training, mm -hmm. uh, often doesn't really make it into that. Well, and it probably shouldn't. Yeah. That's a common question, right? So yeah. Do you strength? Well, no, you wouldn't. Why would you, you know, and these young, uh, athletes, maybe that's part of it too, right? Like why would you waste time on something that doesn't, con if that was the goal to get the highest CTL, then don't strength train, right? Like you wouldn't, you would sweet spot all the time, maybe even tempo, right? Maybe just tempo every single workout, right? You know, you're probably going to get sick eventually, but if that's the goal, then you should just, you know, this is sort of like, you know, well, yeah, I, I don't, I, I think that's the, the, the issue, right? Is like, if, if you got to be careful <laughs> that the, the metric doesn't become the, the goal, because then it's not usable anymore. You know what it sort of reminds me of? It reminds me of in high school when you're prepping for the SATs instead of really thinking about studying what you want to study in college or, yeah, or actually or, just learning for the yeah, sake of learning well, or getting the concepts down right that's the idea is like is it rote memorization or are you actually like understanding how things work I, I think you know with anatomy and it, I, I went through kinesiology in university and that was you know there was the people who just memorized the words and then there's the people that really sort of understood the body right uh and, and maybe someone who understands the body even doesn't remember all the muscles as well right but you can look that stuff up that's that's not hard if you understand the body and where the things are supposed to be right you can i'm always kick myself because i my the back anatomy and i'm just not great with all the there's so many muscles in the back and the shoulder but it's in my day-to-day -day, right like people don't know what you're talking about when you say like you know rhomboids or something right they don't know they just you know squeeze your shoulder blades together or you know do this right you know we're talking about movements usually with people right so you can look it up if it matters but this is this is the idea right so i don't know how we tie that back to tss right it's you know vegetables people understand vegetables right can you how are you going to get that into your your spinach into your eggs in the morning and can you focus on that for a month right and then we'll check we'll see what's 
how are you feeling? How are you, you know, what is that weight if that's the, the goal, right? Yeah, and I think this is also doing a bit of critical thinking about your goals around metrics. Uh, so if your goal is a goal weight, I mean, the big thing is always, why is that your goal weight? I know for, for me, this is something I've had to come to terms with in the last couple of years. Uh, I think I've said it on this podcast before. I don't remember a time in my life since becoming aware of my weight at like probably the fifth grade where I didn't want to quote, lose five pounds we or 10 we all, pounds. Yeah, we probably all have that in there. A lot of us have that in there somewhere right and it's it's knowing that tendency and, and then trying to you know move past that yeah because if i if i back it out it, it makes no sense and you can maybe as, find kind of evidence goal. right like times you were heavier and performed better or uh you know I, I don't know right like what else can you do with that it's i don't know because i've never actually <laughs> lost the five yeah or 10 pounds, which is so. maybe the lesson with weight and, and i think again that's why i use weight i thought it was actually I, I hesitated to use weight but i think it's actually sort of like this ctl like i think you're 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 sort of it's hard to change them again this is for normal people who don't have a lot of flexibility in the you can't just train 20 hours you just don't have it right it's it's eight hours that's what your family your work gives you you could wake up at 4 30 right but this is the same as you know you could also just not eat for a week and, and i bet you that would change that metric but not for the long term and it doesn't develop the habits and the actions and it's just not fun right not for the better <laughs> right so this is the thing is you know can we try and have some fun with this this journey because there's not a whole lot more right like if all it is 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 this fitness score to you know rule them all um you know we're you know i don't know if that's what we set out to do right that's not the journey we set out on yeah, and we'll have a whole post coming on this. Peter has some fabulous analogies and metaphors he's been working on. Well, don't on oversell it, but yeah, try and simplify that that sort of one metric to rule them all, right? And, and the idea that we're coming back to what are the actions we're trying to do, right? What is the thing we're trying to get better at this? And that could be a skill. That could be just your, your sweet spot intervals, right? Just take a real keen interest in that, you know? And I've had a few clients doing a really good job with this where they're okay, yeah, all right, well, I'm going to try and ride this 260, and I'm not going to, you know, sometimes people will, oh, I can do 270. It's like, no, you're supposed to do 260. Just do it, <laughs> right? And the next week, you're going to do it for a little longer or do it for a little, but you got to sit with it, right? And just learn from that, right, experience. And in, in three or four weeks, we can change it up, right? But sometimes that's the the thing that gets missed is this, got to get to 100, got to get to 100 CTL, right? And it's just missing the the practice, right? And that's, that's yeah. what we're going. And it doesn't have to be that geeky as the, the interval stuff, but it can be if that's, if you really like numbers, right. Play around with that. Um, and I think that's, there's something to that, right. I think you can start feeling like a good job. You finish that workout, you know, you went from 260 for three by tens and now you're doing three by twenties at 260, right. And that's pretty cool. Right. And I think that's a good feeling when you see that over time, that change, right. Mm hmm. I have to admit, for me, kind of letting go of all of these metrics, trail running has helped with that immensely Right. Um, because it, it kind of forced me to have to get rid of like notions of weekly mileage and volume and that kind of stuff because like, trail miles and road miles aren't the same thing. Like your pace on the trail is you can't really be super focused on it because it's going to be so wildly variable yeah and you were on we try and have you on a lot of our you know monthly we do like a coffee meetup at the beginning of the month with clients whoever wants to join in right on zoom and that's been good and, and so you were there and i was we were sort of talking a bit about this idea right of just cyclists sometimes forget that you know a lot of the other sports don't have power but like you know yeah. all these cyclists are freaking out their power meter didn't work their trainer didn't turn on the you know power wasn't what i thought it was going to be the whatever right and it's just like no a runner and a cross-country skier they would just slow down and keep going right or you know they, they just they wouldn't even know right in yeah. some cases no i remember when i first started training with my now coach david roche uh the first thing i said was like oh my gosh do i need to should i be like should i get a digital scale should i get a heart rate monitor should i yeah. get all these and anyone who knows david or has listened to any podcast with him ever uh you know the answer to the scale one was a definitive no um and then the answer to the heart rate monitor was are you training with one right now? Like, no. Okay. You don't need one. Like, right. Like I'm, he definitely coaches some people who use them and obviously can coach to that. But because I didn't train with one, it didn't really make sense to suddenly start training with one. Right. And I mean, even so, that could be, you know, even heart rate could be one that's, you know, it's sort of a result too, right. Of, of ultimately your feeling, right. And people don't like feeling, they don't like 
you know, this nebulous thing. And that's why we get onto this one, one metric to rule them all, right? Is we want this just like one thing to know that we're, we're chasing, right? But it's, it's so hard, it, it, you know, and it, because, you know, you take a recovery day and it drops, you take a recovery week, it drops. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, there's ebb and flow, right? The weather's bad. You know, you're busy at work, right? And the thing drops and it's like, well, what if that thing, like, what if you had never heard of it? There's probably people on this who don't, you know, maybe they stop listening because they don't know what CTL is, right? But hopefully that makes sense, right? Even the weight, it, it reminds me of the stock market, right? The best advice is like, you don't check your stocks every day because of the ebb and flow, right? So weight is like this. I would say CTL probably should be like this on the micro day to day, right? Long day, it goes up, it goes down a bit, you know, because it's an average, Right. But then, you know, if the goal were accumulating fitness right now, we would expect in a month, the number is probably higher, right? You've done three, maybe three weeks on and one week off in the stereotypical textbook way. Probably it's gone up. If that's what you were expecting, it would be good to check that it went up. Uh, But those are actions, right? Those are, you know, you trained consistently for four weeks and it went up. Yes. So all that to say, don't put too much stock in any one metric. And if you're sort of struggling because you're stuck in that, it might be time to kind of think of a goal that feels more fun and more non-number oriented, maybe. Just, you know, some people, I, I would say probably on the athlete level, you probably don't even need, right? Like just, you know, probably go back to hours, I guess, but, you know, and, and plan your, your week out that way. But yeah, I don't know. Probably a lot of people, if, if it's stressful, I would just not even, you can definitely do without it. Yes, absolutely. Okay. And then this one's a bit more of a practical question, which is just why do coaches give a range in workouts? And in that, in that same vein, is it okay to always be on the low end? So first let's maybe talk about the couple different ways a coach could give a range in a workout. Right. Well, I mean, people know zones. I really dislike zones. Uh, so that's usually th- something I'm trying to not have people remember but a zone is you know a percentage of either your threshold or your max heart rate or something like that it could also be you you brought up the point to it it could be you're going to run eight to ten miles is you know something like that is a lot of your trainings like that and i'll do like one to two hours or (laughs) when i leave often my rides are between 90 minutes and five hours if i'm fit 90 minutes and three hours if i'm less fit um, but a lot of days are 90 minutes, Molly, I'll tell you, there's not a, true. a lot of days I'm getting fitter now. So today, you know, I was out for three. Um, but I just give myself a lot of times that freedom, right. And it's, it's based on feeling, right. And it's just that consistency over time. I can get it done 90 minutes if it's going well and I'm having fun, I'll do longer. Yeah. And I mean, I'd say from my perspective as the athlete getting prescribed the eight to 10 miles, um, I've definitely found this tricky in the past because I I've always seen this as like this secret test that the coach is giving to see if I'm like tough enough to do the 10 miles or, or is it like a double, like a double blind one where like I'm supposed to pick the eight because I know that's like the right choice for me. And it, it gets very stressful kind of trying to think about what my my coach might be thinking about giving me that eight to 10 or six to eight or whatever it is. Um, and I, I've now realized that the coach is not trying to catch me out on anything. Uh, is that is that true, Glassford? I think so. And you're a good example too, because, you know, again, with running, it's a tough thing to measure. And, and you, some days you're running on a flat rail trail. Most days. Right. So probably 10 miles makes sense if you're feeling good. If it wasn't, you know, sometimes that rail trail is covered in ice and it's slow going or, or, you know, knee deep snow, slow going. Um, You know, so maybe those days you're actually doing less, right? Because you just, for the time it took, took longer, right? But then other days you're, you know, in the mountains and it's again, slow going and maybe you only do eight, right? Um, or maybe you're, you know, running down a mountain <laughs> and you do 11 or something even, right? So I think that's that's the thing, right? And I think if we get into the intensity zones, I think it's very good to be at the bottom of the zone, right? And this is the the thing I bang my head against all the time is this these like online programs. We won't name any today. Uh, but these programs where you ride your trainer and they take your threshold and they give you the ideal target wattage to ride at and it's one wattage to rule them all this should sound familiar and so if you can't do it then you suck because you're not doing what your coach told you to do (laughs) that one they said do 200 watts and you faded and you suck right that's not what we mean there was probably a range it's just the trainer program 
has it isn't reflecting the range, right? So there, there's always this plus minus. A lot of the programs have a plus minus, or I believe it's a bias in some of the programs is what it's called. Uh, and there's about 10%, and that's probably a good range, right? Everything you ever hear probably has about 10% plus minus, right? Uh, sometimes it's way more, sometimes it could be a little tighter, uh, but I think that's probably a good rule of thumb, right? And, and it's just finishing it off, right? And it's because there's heart rate especially, right? There's so much range, right? If it's real hot out, your heart, heart rate's going to be way up at the top, but it's not going to feel very hard. If it's really cold out, like right now, I, you know, for me to get my heart rate over like even 80% right now because it's it was so cold today. Right, right. Right, so you just have to be careful because sometimes it's like you'll drive yourself, if you tried to do intensity and you were like, I'm going to hit 100% max heart rate, you're not going to hit 100% max heart rate, right? And you're not going to hit right. the top of the zone, right? And even wattage is similar, right? Like probably, you know, if, if there's a 10% range and you're aiming for 300 watts, that means, you know, what would be that? 270 would be... a acceptable and 330 so it's 60 watts right uh and that math i don't know if that math holds up but that's that's the idea right there's so much and the idea is just to go so, and steven seiler calls this i stole this but solving the workout and that's where you get the there's a correct solution there's not a correct solution there's a range of solutions but we're trying to say is molly did i'm going to keep with cycling here but 270 watts three by ten great yeah totally did that. great so the next time you do that workout great it's in the bank next time you have two options you could we could build and we could say okay three by 12 three by 15 at same deal 270 try and hit 270 again plus or minus right or we could say 280 next week you're going to do three by 10 at 280 right and, and do you see how that's like it's it's if we only focus on the sliver again the stock market analogy is good if you only focus on today's stock market that's not really the idea right we're, we're supposed to be like accumulating over time so i think the real value is doing the thing before you criticize it or say you're a failure or you suck is just figure out where you are <laughs> and then build on it right 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 and it's not it's just where you are with all the context you have wrapped up yeah so i think maybe my devil's advocate question is if you always opt for the bottom of the range right is that a good thing or a bad thing because i think there is something to be said for not always sticking to the very bottom of the range like there is an element of like trying to kind of push towards that sure and i have different clients i think that's probably where coaches you know as much as there isn't a wrong or right answer like i think your tendencies are going to be where the coach can help push you when the time is right right because i feel like if if i always if i you know had all these eight to tens and i always defaulted to eight i could see david shifting it to like nine to eleven for sure just to try to like bump up the yeah yeah and i do you know my my standard run that i give people who are running is 5Ks to 5 miles, right? It rolls off the tongue, but there's sometimes it becomes a 6K to 6 miles, right? You just creep it up because it's always been 5K and you're like, well, I want this to be longer, right? So you have to watch that sometimes, right? Um, and, and sometimes I will like give someone like a pretty explicit, like Molly, you did 270 last week. I'd like you to try 280 and, and it's okay if you fade. This is the other idea with the range is it has to be stable. And if you fade, you're the worst person, right? And this this then translates to racing, um, you know, or, or these challenge rides is fading as this, this horrible thing where your world's collapsing and, and you'll never finish. And no, the best people in the world fade, probably in some disciplines, cyclocross, you know, track, like the start is so aggressive and so important that like you've damaged yourself, right? Like there's no coming back from it you know, the best people are, are more resilient. They're, they're able to not get damaged as much by it, but it, it's a match, right? You've spent it. Um, so fading happens. It's just, you know, there's tactics to it, right? And it's, I think if in training you've been experienced with, you know, oh, Molly tried 300 for a 10 minute and then was like, oh, oh, that hurt. And then was maybe like, oh, 265 and then saw herself come back up and did a 275 to finish. Then it's like, oh, there's actually a little bit of mental game in that middle one where I bet you, you probably could have done 270. You just didn't believe because you were breathing really hard and your legs were burning in the middle of the, the workout, which we could pretend is like the middle of the race, that valley of despair and the finish line feels so far away and you're, you're tired, but you're expecting to feel better. So now the third workout, we can be like, okay, same thing, but I want you to believe on the second one. And it's okay if the third one falls apart, but I want you to hold 270 or better on the next one, right? So the third one you get in and then you're like, oh yeah, it was fine. You know, I didn't think I was, I thought I was going to have to fade on the third one, but I got to the third one and I could see the finish line. So I did 277, right? And it's like, oh wow. Okay. Well, there you go. Now you believe in yourself and you just learned a bit about pacing. 
there's probably some fitness, but I think a lot of that is actually just the skill of pacing and the mental. This is our holding the hand in the fire, right? right. You, got, you got better at just putting it in far enough. Yeah. So all that to say, if there's a range, feel free to play within it. Don't feel like you have to go to the high end. Don't feel like you're stuck in the low end. Move it within the workout. Yeah. Yeah. And I think even the low end of the range, sometimes I encourage, you know, if it's the first time you've ever seen this and some people are like, oh, I had no idea. Well, then start at the bottom, right? Like usually the workout is designed, you know, close enough to your ability that like you'll be able to finish it. So just always start at the bottom, mm-hmm. right? And then if at the end of that, the third or fourth, whatever the last rep is, you know, go to the top and feel that. And then the next time, again, you can triangulate, you know, and really ride that limit. But yeah, sometimes this is where that block, you know, and we're getting back to that, like, do we focus on the TSS or the CTL or the weight, or do we focus just on the moment, you know, learning that, like, hopefully that, that was helpful just to hear the, like, there's a mental, there's like a strategic, right? There's so many elements wrapped up in those workouts. It, they can be so rich, right? And this is why the comments and the, the like, wh- how did you do the workout is important, right? Because we haven't even spoke about, is this on a hill? Is this a gravel hill? Are you on your race bike? You know, if that's a mountain bike or gravel bike, or are you in an indoor trainer? Are you on a rollers or an indoor trainer, right? Did you put it in the erg mode or the, uh, uh, the like manual mode? You know, there's all these, so I'm trying to, you know, that's trying to always encourage clients like tell me a lot like this is rich even on an indoor trainer like what did you listen to were you firing you know was it a cyclocross race you were like talk about it right like how did you solve this workout it is not just the watts right yeah yeah for sure all right perfect um and last thing that we will touch on today is that uh this is the week it's here the week the day i think it's the 22nd technically uh where most people bail on their new year's resolutions according to science yeah we had some people sort of poking around like what was like what was your uh resolution like are you how are you doing with yours well, i have my one word resolution which okay. was shine okay um, and, and you got to shout out on the the swap podcast from your coach yeah, for, for, for the david, one word david loved the uh the one word so is the one word working or have you thrown it out and now you're you're just you have two words or something uh actually it's it's been working pretty well i've been thinking about it when i'm doing my runs and i'm starting to kind of feel a little a little fady a little grumpy a little a little chilly uh in some cases lately and what um, was the word shine shine um and thinking about that just makes me smile and just kind of think about how I want to be reflecting out to the world and I want my my running to feel really positive and I think that actually really helps Uh, and I have been coming back to we talked a lot about values sort of heading into the end of the year and I've been kind of honing mine I would say and Mm. thinking about them a lot more and yeah I think I think so far it's going well I didn't put any pressure on myself with any really strict resolutions i feel like i have enough pressure on myself with the fact that i am now less than a month out from running 100 miles so felt like that that pretty much ticked that box Hmm. so yeah i'm feeling i'm feeling pretty good how about you well i like to remove things not everyone likes less right i find clients are often resistant to that right a lot of our clients again are, are you know business you know busy people they have families they have work lives that are busy uh, and so they they want to work their way out of things, right? And so I try and always encourage, like, what can we remove that might make this all better? Or even shift, right? Sometimes we don't think about the timing of things. So I don't know that I'm big on New Year's. Really. You, you're the New Year's guru. New Year, new me. Um, but I heard that uh, this year the big TikTok thing was a 2022 rebrand. Uh, which I am very on rebrand. Board with. Yeah, like New Year's resolutions are out. Rebranding is in. How did they do that on TikTok? I don't know if I understand TikTok. Oh, I mean, basically the same way. Any like they dance? Has... No, not necessarily. Like a different dance. No, it was like oh. the same. The same way <laughs> bloggers have been doing New Year, New Me for years now, where they just post a bunch of like resolutions and the products that they're totally going to use that you can also oh. use if you click through to these affiliate. I'll links. let you tell. I got a new pillow, but that's not what we're talking about today. <laughs> Uh, maybe another time, but we'll yeah, see. Yeah, once we I, I got an it. affiliate code for Casper. <laughs> I got it. Hey, now you mentioned the brand. You gave it away. Uh, we'll see how that goes. So anyhow, I was like, I'm going to just not use my phone uh, in the morning for like, I, I had, you know, everyone wa- looks at their phone while they're eating, right? This seems like this is just everywhere now. Maybe not everyone, but 
I was just like, I'm not going to go on social media and I'm not going to use my phone while reading burgers. And already we've had like more conversations in the morning. We've yeah, had some good laughs. You, it's annoying. Well, you don't like it. Sometimes I just sit in <laughs> silence. And, and uh, what I'm finding, I don't know that it's necessarily decreased my, if I looked, I haven't looked at my like screen time measures on my phone or anything. Uh, I'm probably on my phone as much. But it's shifted later in the day at the very least. And I'm finding that it helps those first couple hours. And for me, like those first one or two hours of the day, like I get probably 80% of my stuff done uh, before everything else, emails get distracted. So I have my email box paused, no social media. I eat breakfast. You know, we've done some morning core and then into the work day. Uh, And we tend to start, you know, well before nine, certainly uh, for that. So I try and get like, again, those first hour or two before things start happening and emails and everything else. And so, so far it's been really, really good. Um, All that to say. Yeah. And I I will actually add to that. A, you have been much, you have been very pleasant at breakfast. I would like you to leave me alone so I can read my (laughs) book, but that's fine. Uh, No, I've also started to do just not checking my email first thing when I wake up, which is definitely a struggle for me, but I'm trying to get more work done right as I head into the day, right as I start the day. So similar to you where I'm not checking it until sort of after that 9 a.m. So hopefully I've gotten one of my big writing projects done. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I do think it is it is helpful. It's very hard right now. This is the first like week I've been trying it, but I'm, I'm working on it. I don't know what that has to do with my words or my values, but working on it. I guess maybe it has to do with my one value of autonomy, uh, not feeling like I'm tethered to my inbox or like, like I have to exist in my inbox. Or maybe the shine is, you know, it's easier to let yourself shine if you haven't been, you know, I don't know, whatever happens with reading the, the news. Yeah, there you go. Or, or just distracted, right? I think it's, I, I find that even with my social media, it's not that there's any doom and gloom, I would say. it's Although there is some of that, but I think most of it is some of the ideas, like I just see so many, like there's sports physiologists and all these other coaches and whatever and so it's like i almost get off on these other tangents and then i you know forget about the things i'm supposed to be you know going deeper on or you know that sort of stuff right and just distracting not that i don't necessarily even get it done but again it's not maybe at that shine level if if Mm -hmm. we're going to use your one word i like it so maybe that's your word too Mm, i'm okay (laughs) don't want to i don't want to add anything to it Uh, fair enough fair enough yours is less or minimalism or something i don't know about that that's just that no. sounds trendy yeah no more of no <laughs> all um, right but that's well. that so that's a check-in on that we'll see hopefully everyone's uh you know using them for what they are and, and it's, it's positively influencing if you uh, have any questions uh for the next q a we'll do that again in two weeks uh anything else today no if you have any questions hit us up over at consummateathlete.com or at consummate athlete on instagram and as usual thank you so much for tuning in we love you we appreciate you and we will see you next week. thanks so much for tuning into the consummate athlete podcast if you enjoyed this or any of our past episodes do us a solid and leave us a rating or review wherever you listen to podcasts and check out our book becoming a consummate athlete over at consummateathlete.com Questions or comments? Find us over on Instagram at consummateathlete, and we will see you next week.